Hello and welcome. This is Dr. Alex Vasquez, and the purpose of this presentation on the integrative management of hypertension is to review the highlights of the socioeconomics, pathophysiology, and differential diagnosis of high blood pressure. This presentation was first made in January 2011, and the scope of this presentation is to review key clinical aspects of adult chronic hypertension. Future presentations in this series will detail evidence-based treatment strategies including diet, nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, spinal manipulation, surgical techniques, and drug management. Hello and welcome. This is an audio video excerpt of material from Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension. The complete video is available at OptimalHealthResearch.com. The entire functional and integrative medicine approach is detailed in the textbook Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension available from OptimalHealthResearch.com, Amazon.com, and other bookstores. Information sources for this presentation on the integrative management of chronic hypertension includes peer-reviewed research articles from biomedical journals, approximately 350 citations specific to hypertension from a recent review of the literature published in January of 2011. Other sources of information and perspective uh, included in this presentation are, of course, my own uh, training and clinical experiences as a doctor of chiropractic, doctor of naturopathic medicine, and doctor of osteopathic medicine. While the purpose of this presentation is to focus on adult hypertension, many of the diagnostic and treatment considerations, which will be covered in another presentation, are appropriately applicable to children. Normal and abnormal values for blood pressure in infants and children are different from those of adults and are stratified based on age, gender, and height in a chart that's available online from the International Pediatric Hypertension Association at, on the internet at pediatrichypertension.org. So in discussing the differential diagnosis of hypertension, We'll run through this list in alphabetical order, and we'll start with aortic coarctation. Aortic coarctation, or coarctation of the aorta, is the second most common cause of hypertension in children. It's two to five times more common in males. Typical age of diagnosis is five years of age. Presentation typically includes upper extremity hypertension and leg blood pressure that is at least 20 millimeters of mercury less than arm blood pressure. We also commonly note uh, delayed or absent femoral pulses. There may also be an audible murmur or a brewery. The diagnosis can be made by transthoracic ultrasonography for children and MRI if it's caught later in adulthood. Um, CT scanning and MRA may also be used. But in children, the age group most typically affected, uh, the diagnosis can be made uh, preferentially by transthoracic ultrasonography. Our next consideration in the differential diagnosis of hypertension will be cocaine use. Cocaine can cause acute and chronic elevations in blood pressure. Of course, drug cessation is the key to treatment, and urine drug testing is appropriate for patients suspected of having uh, either recent or undisclosed drug use. An impressive number of these tests, these urine drug tests, come back positive even on patients who promise to have never used or to have not recently used any recreational drugs. So whether we're dealing with patients of higher or lower um, socioeconomic characteristics, we certainly need to consider illicit drug use. In this case, cocaine specifically, just do a urine drug test. Uh, often these panels will screen for a variety of different um, drugs. Cocaine is the one that's most notorious for contributing to hypertension. Our next consideration in the differential diagnosis of chronic hypertension will be Cushing disease and Cushing syndrome, also more generically known as hypercortisolism. Excess glucocorticoids, whether endogenous or exogenous, promote sodium retention uh, directly via their weak mineralocorticoid effect and also by causing hyperinsulinemia via induction of peripheral insulin resistance. Both of these pathophysiologic processes can contribute to hypertension. Clinical characteristics of patients with Cushing disease or Cushing syndrome 
include classic moon facies, striae, sarcopenia, and abdominal obesity. For iatrogenic or exogenous hypercortisolism, we can usually determine this just by reviewing the patient's medication intake. Typically, or classically, this is a patient taking steroids for some type of inflammatory disease. For endogenous hypercortisolism, uh, we note about uh, two to five diagnoses per million patients per year, so relatively rare. Um, we assess this with measurements of serum ACTH. 24-hour urine uh, free cortisol levels has been uh, one of the gold standards for a long time. More recently, uh, nighttime salivary cortisol has been used and has been established as a reliable um, marker for hypercortisolism. And also, again, classically, the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. Treatment for endogenous hypercortisolism can include uh, surgical removal of any ACTH uh, pituitary, ACTH producing pituitary adenomas uh, in the classic uh, scenario of Cushing disease. An additional type of Cushing syndrome can result from ectopic ACTH production from tumors such as small cell carcinoma of the lung or a carcinoid tumor. Drug side effects can also cause hypertension. Many pharmaceutical drugs can cause an elevation in blood pressure. Reviewing adverse effects of each drug that a patient is taking may be sufficient to identify the offending agent. A clinical trial of discontinuation may be appropriate to determine if a drug is causing or contributing to elevated blood pressure in a particular patient. Drugs worthy of mention include amphetamines, uh, several different antidepressant drugs, carbamazepine, uh, again, fluoxetine, which is another SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, lithium, tricyclic antidepressants, prednisone and methylprednisolone, and sympathomimetic decongestants. Estrogen and oral contraceptives can also contribute to the development and perpetuation of hypertension. Estrogens generally tend to promote sodium and water retention, which promotes volume overload and the development of hypertension. For women with what we might call estrogen dominance due to excess endogenous production or exogenous administration of estrogens, uh, in clinical practice, we can supplement these patients with uh, vitamin B6, pyridoxine, uh, 50 to 250 milligrams per day. If we're using pyridoxine in the hydrochloride form, uh, we co-administer magnesium, perhaps somewhere between 200 to uh, 1,200 milligrams per day or to bowel tolerance. Uh, one of the ways we know that we've reached our maximum dose in a given patient with magnesium supplementation is that patients develop loose stools due to the osmotic effect of the magnesium in the bowel. Uh, we can also use a so-called activated form of B6, pyridoxal 5-phosphate. We can also use a transdermal or oral uh, natural progesterone to offset some of the uh, effects of estrogen. So these are some ways that we can help patients uh, restore balance and um, uh, alleviate some of the negative effects of estrogen by helping their bodies metabolize that estrogen in a more healthy manner uh, and or balance the estrogen with progesterone, which helps to downregulate uh, some of the estrogen receptors. Ethanol overconsumption, or more commonly referred to as alcoholism, uh, does raise blood pressure and makes hypertension more difficult to treat. Of course, many patients in clinical practice are noted to uh, fail to accurately disclose the extent and duration of their alcohol consumption. Clues to occult alcoholism may include socioeconomic problems, such as difficulty maintaining uh, friendships, relationships, and uh, income. Elevations of AST greater than elevations of ALT, uh, often along with elevations of GGT and also alkaline phosphatase. Uh, triglycerides are classically elevated as well. In the later stages of the condition, we see hepatic cirrhosis, splenomegaly, pancytopenia, uh, and occasionally we see this, at least in the hospital scenarios that I've uh, participated in, sometimes we see end stage alcoholic liver disease, even in patients who are in denial about their alcohol intake. Differential diagnosis that we also want to keep in mind in patients with liver disease who we uh, suspect of perhaps being alcoholic. We want to consider chronic viral hepatitis B or C, hemochromatosis and other forms of iron overload, 
and again, overuse of other drugs and medications, and of course, psychiatric disorders need to be considered in the differential diagnosis of any uh, addiction and dependency disorder. Gestational hypertension and preeclampsia also need to be considered in our differential diagnosis of adult hypertension. Pregnancy-induced hypertension, that is, after week 20 of gestation, without proteinuria is termed gestational hypertension. Uh, gestational hypertension with concomitant proteinuria is termed preeclampsia. And if the patient also develops seizures, then we advance the diagnosis to eclampsia. Preeclampsia can accelerate rapidly and cause life-threatening complications for the mother and or the fetus. Treatment generally requires parenteral therapy, intravenous magnesium sulfate for seizure prophylaxis, hydralazine and or libidolol for hypertension control. Emergency delivery of the uh, infant also is a well-recognized treatment for preeclampsia and eclampsia. Some evidence suggests that the incidence of preeclampsia can be reduced by increased intake of aspirin, ascorbic acid, also known as vitamin C, calcium, tocopherols, which of course is vitamin E, and magnesium. Also by pre-pregnancy treatment and or cure of diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. Hypercalcemia can also cause hypertension. This is easily diagnosed by routine laboratory testing. Hypercalcemia can be caused by hyperparathyroidism, malignancy, sarcoidosis, Paget's disease of bone, or very rarely by nutritional excess of calcium and or vitamin D. When primary hyperparathyroidism is suspected, the serum level of intact parathyroid hormone, or IPTH, is tested. When malignancy uh, is suspected, particularly from the finding of an unexplained serum calcium greater than 13 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, Patient-centered evaluation is performed, which often includes uh, initial chest radiograph, followed by what we call in the hospitals pan scanning uh, with CT, uh, CT scanning for occult malignancies of the thorax, such as lung cancer, abdomen, and pelvis for gastrointestinal tumors. So, uh, a slight modification in the way that I can describe that is that hypercalcemia, when encountered clinically, uh, the test should be repeated to confirm the hypercalcemia. In an outpatient setting, the most common causes of hypercalcemia are hyperparathyroidism, sarcoidosis. Uh, in older patients with appropriate clinical findings, we might think of Paget's disease of bone. But really, clinically, we want to think of hyperparathyroidism and sarcoidosis. Uh, also, malignancy. Malignancy is the most common cause of hypercalcemia in an inpatient setting. Hyperparathyroidism is the most common cause in an outpatient setting. Some endocrinologists advocate testing for 24-hour urinary calcium levels as a test for a condition called familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. So again, that's one more differential that we want to include as we're working up hypercalcemia as a potential contributor to or cause of hypertension. Hello and welcome. This is an audio video excerpt of material from Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension. The complete video is available at OptimalHealthResearch.com. The entire functional and integrative medicine approach is detailed in the textbook Integrative Medicine and Functional Medicine for Chronic Hypertension, available from OptimalHealthResearch.com, Amazon.com, and other bookstores.